Welcome to Club E. Hi, I'm Rick Brimacombe of Brimacombe & Associates. I am your architect of business growth and will work with you to unlock your potential and amplify the scale of your company. Today, we're talking about business built on curiosity. I want to thank our sponsors, Irish Titan, an e-commerce and web development firm, Highland Bank, a locally owned community bank, Romaine Berg, a digital marketing agency, Schwegman, Lumberg, Woosner, an intellectual property law firm, and Voyager U, an independent community of individual workers such as yourself. All right, to participate in the comments section today and being in YouTube, go into the comments field, submit your questions. You can see John's email address. You can communicate with us and we'll do our best to weave your questions into our conversation. You can also catch Club E on your favorite podcast platform. Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and many others. And with that, I want to introduce today's guest, John Cosgrove, founder of VoiceHive. Welcome, John. Hey, Rick. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and delighted that this could work out. Yeah, so John and I have known each other for several years. We're working on some uh, projects together, so uh, it's a privilege to have you here, John. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and the various things that you're up to these days. Well, as I like to say these days, especially this time of year, I am an accent waiting to happen. Uh, I got off the boat from the homeland, the north of Ireland, 22 years ago this summer. I uh, immediately started working with uh, local Irish guru, kingpin, Kieran Folliard, worked for him for eight years. And it was him that instilled that sort of idea of curiosity. And now um, I've got three or four hustles going, for want of a better word. But my main one is VoiceHive an event software platform that uh, keeps me busy and pre-COVID got me uh, to travel and meet some really interesting people around the world. I also have three kids uh, who like hockey in the winter, summer, uh, soccer in the summer. So I'm not bored. Yeah, definitely not. So between the three kids and then on the hobby front, you're also a cyclist as well as an avid soccer player. Uh, more, yes, lots of enthusiasm to make up for the lack of competency, shall we say. And uh, it's something that keeps me in shape and is also with that camaraderie. I'm at the age now where I'm almost ready to play in the over 50s league, but I'm in denial. I'm going to stick with the over 40s league. All right. And uh, you mentioned to me before we went on the air, they're going to have to carry you off the pitch before you quit, correct? Well, yes, because I, I don't like running. I, like, I, I don't own a treadmill. I don't go running around the lakes. I, if I'm going to run, I need to have a target and I need to have someone to get out of the way in order to get to it. And then I'm not focused on the running. And soccer does that for me. I also enjoy watching it. And I have a soccer podcast uh, with a good Australian friend of mine. So we get to go to Minnesota United games. And uh, so it's it's pretty prominent. My kids play as well. So uh, there's a high enthusiasm level for it. So tell us a little bit about the podcast. Let's start there. Crafty Rogues. Just give us a little background. Uh, well, uh, I've always wanted to have a podcast and you know soccer is something that i'm interested in so i thought i'd start there i'm fortunate that i'm friends with a guy called stephen quinn quino to his friends who uh, in australia spent 30 years in the broadcasting world so in order to start a podcast i thought it'd be a good idea to talk to him um about the logistics of it it turns out he played professional soccer in australia so by you know by that circumstance this is four years ago it made sense for us to work together on the podcast, which we have. And we said, we'll keep doing it until it's not fun. And we're still doing it 242 episodes later. All right. And then you and I met through uh, Voice Hive and Cosgrove Presents. So tell the audience a little bit more about that. Cosgrove Presents was something I set up about 15, 16 years ago as I was sort of departing the hospitality industry of restaurants and pubs. And uh, initially, it was mainly focused on trivia for corporate events and team building, and uh, then evolved into emceeing and some facilitation. And then as the uh, events got bigger and there was more engagement and I was seeing the development of apps, I hired some developers to build me sort of a, a little trivia app where I didn't have to run around and answer, uh, do math, basically. Math is not my strong point. And that evolved into VoiceHive, which has become this fully fledged platform. One thing I learned early on 
is that it it's better to have people around you who are more competent and more skilled than you are. And um, I'm fortunate my business partner in VoiceHive, Andy Grant, is a very competent and very skilled developer. So VoiceHive has kind of evolved from something that we use for live polling and Q&A into this fully fledged platform. My job is to talk about it and talk to as many people as possible about it. And then, you know, he's on the on the service side and the tech side and it, it's worked so well so far. I would compare it. It's almost like the uh, the Elton John, Bernie Topin model where one writes the lyrics and one writes the music and it's worked so far, well so far for us. All right. So um, also last one, want to ask about your role and uh, what you're doing with the Celtic Croft. Well, this was a project that you introduced me to. And uh, to quote your paraphrase, what you said, you weren't quite sure what Cosgrove was going to bring, but there was going to be some sort of level of magic. Well, I can't promise that. But of course, I have a, a, a strong connection to the homeland and to culture and tradition. So any time that I can maintain that connection in a meaningful way, it motivates me. And then, of course, if there's money to be made, that's an extra motivator. So it's been an interesting project, in, not in a Minnesota interesting way, in an Irish interesting way, which is it, it, it genuinely trying to connect uh, a business that has its roots in tradition with uh, the wider market. So I've, I've been very, very interested in how that's developed. And, uh, you know, there's no bad ideas. And I'm looking forward to exploring lots more ideas around that. So, uh, and I, uh, as a uh, shareholder and participate with the Celtic Croft, definitely appreciate your involvement and look forward to more magic going forward. Yes, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a blend of being aware of the culture and the tradition and then bringing a little bit of lightness and a little bit of humor to it because it makes it a lot more positive. We can't be talking just about tradition and culture because people start to nod off. Um, we need to make it also engaging and entertaining. That's my philosophy. And uh, that's what's worked with for me so far. And whether it's a Celtic Croft or these other things, and uh, we'll talk about St. Patty's Day in a minute, but no shamrockery. Yeah, that was a, a phrase that was coined back in the day when I got off the boat and started, which of course, I didn't actually get off a boat, but that's what we say. And um, around the Irish pub industry, we're, we're Irish 365 days of the year. These pubs that throw up their neon shamrocks and their leprechauns, we call that shamrockery. That's what we, that's the word we have for it. We're, uh, we're like the puppy. We're not just for Christmas, we're for life. We're Irish all year long, not just on St. Patrick's Day. All right. And I also know you have the ability to kind of dial up and back the, um, uh, the accent depending on the time of year. 100%. Couldn't agree. I mean, I, St. Patrick's Day in this time of year is a huge marketing opportunity for anyone who's Irish and in business. My old mentor, Kieran Folliard, used to say, if we could find 11 other saints, we'd only need to work 12 days of the year and it would take care of itself. For, unfortunately, we just have one saint, so we have to make the most of it. So it's all systems go at this time of year. Every TV, radio, podcast station is going to be hearing or has heard, heard from me in the past couple of weeks as we try and amplify my business uh, using the accent. And I make no bones or make no apologies for it. All right. So um, for whatever it's worth, anybody cares out there, probably not too many people, but I'm actually 18.75% Irish. That's if anybody wants to do the math, 1264. So I've gone back five, six generations. I'm wondering, is that enough to qualify me to be considered part of the real Irish family? Let me, let me explain. I'll explain this as best I can, um, which is if you care that much to that degree, 1264, if it's that important to you and it means that much to you and it's somewhere in your heart or somewhere in your soul or somewhere in your psyche, then it's important and then it counts. Um, if, you, if, if you're apathetic towards it, then of course it wouldn't count. But if it means that much to you, then yes, we welcome you with open arms. All right, well, thank you. And I mentioned to you before we went on air that uh, my mother's uh, father, Bulger, B-U-L-G-E-R, came across, um, I assume, on the boat, uh, given the, uh, the year, which would have been the late 1800s. For sure. Um, and O'Bulger was the name. So it does mean something to our family. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And I, I encourage anyone with any, any level of Irish heritage um, to maintain it. I mean, 
for some reason, the Irish are loved worldwide, generally. And the PR machine that started in the mid 1800s is still rolling on. And I'm not going to put any sand in the gears, let me tell you. Absolutely. So it's March, St. Patrick's Day, as we've touched on a little bit. Maybe just tell the audience a little bit about what it actually means. Well, of course, it, it really uh, shines a light on our heritage and our culture. And, you know, we, you, you know, from one extreme, which is the green beer and the leprechauns all the way to uh, people really wanting to understand the culture of Ireland and uh, what it means to be Irish. It's obviously very important to the Irish natives and diaspora across the world. Uh, there's apparently some like 70 million of us spread throughout the world. So it's a day to reconnect with our Irishness, depending on what your level of that is. So that's obviously important. Connecting with the family back home and uh, really thinking about what it means and the responsibility of being Irish, which is, you know, we have this reputation. We, we enjoy a good time. We have a sense of humor. Uh, we have a, a strong work ethic. And it's important to maintain those ideals and amplify them again. And this is our stage to do it at this time of year. All right, a reminder to our audience that you can go on the comments field if you're on YouTube, submit a question for John and I, and we will try to work it into our conversation. In addition, you can hit the subscribe button and hopefully the like one as well. Um, we do want your participation, so please don't hesitate. And again, given that it's March, we've got St. Patrick's Day coming up, fabulous time to ask any questions of John. All right, so, um, we uh, established you did not come over on a boat. However, I'm assuming there is some story behind you coming to America that would be uh, of interest to our audience. Uh, well, everyone's got a story about how they ended up here. Um, I, growing up, I had a lot of uh, American relatives. My grandmother had a number of sisters who moved to Philadelphia in the 20s and 30s and 40s and had a lot of kids and they would come home in the summertime and complain that we didn't have pizza on every corner and i found them quite irritating uh this uh american culture now bear in mind it's philadelphia and the east coast so take that with what you want and um, i had i definitely wanted to travel beyond ireland uh 19 when i was at college i lived in london for a year which is a wonderful cosmopolitan city where you do meet a lot of other cultures from around the world. I've also lived in Cape Town, South Africa for a year because I am in Ireland, uh, for sure, you're politicized before you're baptized. So I was fascinated to go to South Africa in the mid 90s and lived there for a year. Um, I really didn't have the United States on my radar beyond maybe checking it out as a visit now and again, but my brother had been here and had been to Minneapolis and came back and said, I think you'd like Minnesota, it's not quite as American as the other parts. In fact, it's got a little bit of Canadian feel to it. And I dismissed that, but I'd met some people from Minnesota, came over, and then when I met Kieran Folliard, who is uh, from the West Coast of Ireland, I was kind of hooked. He kind of really gave me the, 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 the non-sugar-coated version of the opportunities that were here. We didn't, you know, I didn't have somebody dialing up the rhetoric it was dialing down the rhetoric he said there are opportunities here and um if you're willing to work and and uh i took on board what he said and i ended up staying i had planned to come for two weeks and uh, here i am 22 years later so literally you came for a two-week visit and you did not go back at least on the front end correct um but at the same time it, there really wasn't much draw to going back i knew i wanted to keep traveling if i had left here i would have gone somewhere else it wasn't about returning back to ireland um ireland with all its beauty and all its culture and tradition i always felt a little stifled there um i've got a, a big personality and uh, um like anywhere else small town small communities um it can get a little stuffy and it was always in my head to get out of town and check out the rest of the world and find a place where I could really explore myself as much as anything else. And then uh, you've mentioned now a couple times the Irish pubs and your experiences throughout that. Um, uh, talk a little bit more about that and then maybe uh, any specific learnings from those days that you carry with you today. Uh, yeah, well, you know, landing in Minnesota or any Irish person in the old days uh, landing. This is before the internet, of course, and you 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 hear the stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. You either go to the building site to get a job, or you go to the pub. Well, I'd heard about winters in Minnesota, so I didn't fancy the building sites. I also had 
come from a hospitality background. I'd worked in hotel industry in Ireland and, and in London and in the pub. So I felt like I could start there and, and work my way from there. And like I said, uh, meeting Kieran was important. And he was on the precipice of growing his business. And uh, he looked at my resume and not just listened to my accent. I would like to think so anyway. And um, he, he presented the opportunity of not just working there, but developing ideas for what I wanted to do beyond that, whether that was part of his organization or not. But he also had a couple of very strong fundamental foundational ideas around business and one of the, how to differentiate yourself as you're competing what are the areas that you can um, focus on and amplify that will make you stand out from your competitors and of course there's nothing more competitive than the restaurant business as he said many times everywhere's got hot food and cold beer how do we differentiate ourselves well it's going to be in the service so that was really important and as i started um my software business and and that uh, competing against very large, well-funded companies, it became that service that uh, and that attention to detail and almost hospitality around it that would differentiate us from our competitors. So that thread has remained very strong from day one. So um, uh, let's stay there for a minute. Talk a little bit about Voice Hive. Um, where'd the idea come from? Uh, what's the business look like now? Progress you've made, et cetera. Uh, well, it started with the idea, I mean, at that time, I was involved in the corporate association event world where I was being hired to MC and present at the event. So I'm obviously I'm being exposed to the industry on a wider level around engagement. I had this little bit of technology for trivia. And I remember being at a, a conference where they had 2000 of the brightest and best in the industry attending a general session and they had a, a table full of experts on the stage and they had four microphones to generate and garner ideas from the audience and i'm like there's two thousand people here and there's four microphones and we're all sitting here on our phone so the idea came well if everybody here had an opportunity to engage with what was going on stage there could be this this mass engagement that would be more beneficial to everybody and given that i already had a prototype with the trivia it just seemed like a a natural progression so i switched the focus from the trivia to more of the the general engagement at events and that was the starting point around live polling submitting questions uh some word clouds and some other fun stuff approach clients that i'd worked with as an mc or worked with in events before and really talk to them about this engagement piece which was growing as a um an idea around events you know when you think about conferences 15 20 years ago you get a big speaker they come out they spew their 10 points do these 10 things and live happily ever after and everybody goes home well with the advent of the internet now people demand to be engaged they demand to um have their voices heard too and create that sense of community so just from a timing standpoint it worked well to have to bring this platform that utilized that, but also made it easy for people to engage. So we started with just the polling, the Q&A and that level. Then we moved on to registration because as you become competent at one particular element, um, your customers are like, well, you did a nice job of that. Maybe you could provide us with this. You start asking them, where else are you having problems? Where else are you finding those friction points? And those the customers are giving you your clients are giving you all the ideas you need. Of course, the trick then is to execute on those. So voice Hive has evolved over the last 12 years, starting with very basic level competency. And then as we grow and customizing uh, these tools and providing those to the clients, you're building trust. So we have clients that have been with us pretty much since day one. So you're maintaining your client base and that gives you a good foundation to grow. So you hit on a couple of words, engagement, community. Um, as you look back over the Voice Hive and Cosgrove uh, Presents experience, um, what do you think are the key attributes that make a successful event? And how is that different, say, today versus pre-COVID? Well, I think COVID or no COVID, the, the, the elements are the same. You got to provide something. You got to provide content that's, that's interesting, that isn't just rehashed. Uh, there's uh, wonderful, you know, we live in a country with so much talent here, 
and people are, are always looking for magic answers. There aren't any magic answers. And uh, it's, it's all about, you know, you can be given the 12 best tools or 10 best tools or five best ideas for anything within your business. It's how do you apply them yourself? How do you take those ideas and, and apply them to your own business? So a good event will help generate those conversations. Now, you and I have probably, and many people watching, have probably been to many conferences, but the real value is in that connection. The conversations that are happening in the hallways and the side rooms are the ones that are really good. You're going to take from you whatever about the pizzazz and the entertainment, which has its place. It's that key engagement of whether it's a small group of people or a larger group of people coming together that will really make the event valuable. It might not be the most pizzazzy event, but the real value is how do I connect to the people that I need to connect to in order to elevate my own business or my own ideas. And that's what's gonna make an event successful. And you can do that virtually now, you can do it in person, and uh, there is no excuse. What this last year has shown us in terms of events, I remember one of my favorite stories from the last year is we have a client who has a small conference in Wilmer, Minnesota, and they have about 200 people show up every year, they get together, they drink, uh, bad beer, but they discuss good ideas. This year they put it online because they had to, they had 800 people there from all over the world who are probably never going to go to Wilmer, Minnesota, but they have a chance to engage with Midwest people that they hadn't before and vice versa. And all, obviously from that, the ideas are percolating uh, way more than they had been in the past. So to me, a good idea is one that facilitates those conversations and those ideas. So uh, with your uh, business having kind of multiple prongs to it, multiple hustles, as you said, how have they all changed and how have you adjusted to life uh, post COVID? Well, up until uh, last year, I was probably doing maybe half a dozen uh, trivia events a year because, you know, voice I've been, been taking uh, the main stage as it should. Um, but as, as, uh, COVID starts to settle in and, and starts to become part of the narrative, groups need to engage and uh, nothing more fun than an Irish guy hosting trivia. So I've done a few of those and I've volunteered a few for many of them and, and not just here in Ireland as well, which has been kind of fun for me as well to reconnect there. So that's been something. And uh, from, a, from a technical standpoint, the work that we'd been doing pre-COVID was very much relevant during COVID, which is building online tools for engagement. So that really hasn't switched. We'd already been working with clients who on a global level had, you know, uh, webinars and virtual events already in place. And that engagement had a platform had already been utilized. So we were just taking that model and applying it to clients that maybe had didn't have that in the past. So you have a couple of uh, strong interests as well as personal drivers. Um, obviously, uh, you like your humor uh, and fun. You want your life to be fun. Soccer is a big one, your Irish heritage. What um, of those things as well as in just your kind of personal makeup um, cause or keep you motivated on a daily basis to, to keep going out there and, you know, just kind of gr grind, not in a bad way, but grind in a, hey, I'm busy, you got a lot of balls in there, doing a lot of things. What's your daily motivation? Uh, curiosity, because it, it ties back to that. I'm curious to see, you know, I'm, we're in the middle of uh, revamping our entire um, communication structure within Voice. I have two our clients, to existing clients, and to potential new clients. And it's, it's exciting for me to learn these new tools. I'm learning about tools uh, online tools and marketing tools that I haven't had to utilize before because I've been more or less reliant on myself. So when you have a curiosity, I say this to my kids all the time, you don't need to have a passion in order to succeed, in order for life to be interesting. Um, you can have a curiosity. So I have a kid who goes, I wonder what it would be like to bake cookies. Well, let's go find out. It might be completely boring, but you don't have to develop a passion for baking in order to try to bake some cookies. Let's bake some cookies. And if that's interesting, let's see where that leads. And that's been my thread, my thread. I'm working at an Irish pub and, you know, 
full disclosure, we're trying to milk the Yanks for as much as we can by having as many events as possible to get them into the pub. So we have a quiz night and the room is full. And I'm like, I wonder what would happen if we did this more often? What do you know? Next thing you know, there's bar trivia in the Twin Cities. So we like to claim that we were the first one. Uh, there's a, a company called the Trivia Mafia, but we all know who the godfather is and you're listening to him right now. So, but the, with that curiosity, then that goes to, I'm at the conference and I'm seeing the need for engagement. Well, let's see if what we have can work there. I didn't have a passion for conferences to be more engaging. Some people might, that might be their driver. Mine is like, I wonder what would happen if we did that. I remember too being at a, uh, an event where the speaker asked everyone to take out a dollar bill. And we took out our dollar bills. We didn't have one, we borrowed one. This is maybe 10 years ago. And she said, hold it up and I want you all to rip it in two. Well, there might have been about 200 people there and only two of us ripped up the dollar bill. And she asked the first guy, why did you rip up the dollar bill? And he goes, because you told me to. And then she asked me and I said, well, I've never done it before. I want to see what it felt like. <laughs> and that spoke to me that reflected back to me where my personality is i may not you know i don't need to have all the t's crossed and i's dotted in order to give it a go i'll give it a go i've tried golf all the curiosity in the world is not going to make me want to go back onto a golf course because i've tried it enough times to know that's not for me i've tried distance swimming iron man I'm, I'm thinking about that i'm not curious about that because i've put my toe in the water and i have no interest in it i'm going to stick to soccer but following the curiosity to see what gets your interest going gives you that sort of freedom to try it out and see without the pressure of finding your passion and blah blah to me that's a motivational speaker trying to sell his books or his videos or whatnot i think following your curiosity takes a lot of that pressure away Okay, so I'm going to back up a little bit on the front end of this. I, I mentioned the Celtic Croc, your involvement. So uh, back up in time, a little over a year ago, it was right before COVID hit. I call you up and I say, hey, I got this project. I'm working on it. I think it would be uh, interesting for you to be involved. What about the Celtic Croc caused you to uh, want to get involved? Uh, well, some of it was that curiosity where I'm like, this is interesting. And this is a business that I've not really, that I really know much about in terms of retail, because I'd not been in that retail space. But I also saw it as an opportunity to bring some of my personality to it, without really fully knowing what that looked like. But given my personality, some would call it narcissism, maybe, you know, uh, ex friends, um, I would like to call it that uh, interest. And I saw an opportunity to bring a little bit of personality to something to see where it ended up. And if it didn't work out, well, no one's going to die and no one's going to lose any limbs. But so let's give it a shot and see what happens. And of course, it speaks to culture and tradition, two things that are important to me as well. So there was no reason not to try it. And in hindsight, I'm glad I did. Yeah, well, uh, I'm glad you did too. And I if was somebody had come to me, Rick, with uh, an idea around, you know, let's say German heritage, then maybe it may be more of a struggle unless it involved drinking big steins of beer. But you know, trying to trying to wedge an Irish guy with a German plan may not be the make the most sense. But Celtic Croft, Scottish, Irish, Welsh heritage, Irish guy, yeah, I can go with that. All right. Well, I uh, appreciate you uh, joining the family. Um, you, joining uh, the clan, as they like to see in Scotland. Joining the clan. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, talk, uh, let's also jump back here to um, your roots. Uh, as, as you reflect on, on your time in Ireland and you still have family there, still go there uh, when COVID uh, allows, um, what do you miss most about living in Ireland? Um, the countryside. I grew up in the country where it's quiet and reflective, which is always good to indulge there, you know, community, knowing everybody, there is an upside to that, and having that sense of a common purpose. Uh, it's less so it's more fragmented here in the US. Uh, or particularly where you know, I live in the city of Minneapolis, and I live in a neighborhood where I know some of my neighbors, but if this was in Ireland, I'd know all of my neighbors. And it would be in my interest to know all of my neighbors, because you know, there is that strong sense of community and, and heritage. Uh, so I definitely miss that. I, I don't miss the rain, that's for certain. And one of the 
great people talk about the cold weather here in Minnesota. I have no problem with the cold weather. It was the rain that really was a struggle for me because it's really hard to engage uh, when it's raining outside. If it's cold, just wrap up. If it's too hot, you know, throw on the sunscreen away you go. Rain really makes it difficult. So I don't miss that. Obviously, family. Uh, I have uh, three brothers that still live in Ireland, a sister that lives in England, all married, all with kids. So I'm not engaging with them on a regular basis beyond, um, you know, Zoom and whatnot. I try to go home at least once a year, try to go home twice a year if I can, at least once with my kids so that they can feel that connection. And thankfully they do. My parents are still alive and well and healthy. And it's always good. It's a good grounding. I mean, I seriously could be, you know, and and the New York uh, Stock Exchange opening bell, voice hives about to go public. I'm about to be a gajillionaire and I go home and my mom would make comment about, you know, there's a wrinkle in my shirt. So it it really keeps you grounded, which is important because at the end of the day, you know, I've got all these little voices in my head from people and and uh, relatives from days gone by in different scenarios that can be helpful and grounding. And so if I get too carried away with myself, it's always nice to have that to fall back on. And of course, the local pub at home with the pints and the characters in there, uh, I'm always going to miss that. And that can't be replicated anywhere. So not replicated anywhere. I'd also think that the personalities in Minnesota, uh, a lot of uh, Scandinavians, the Germans, we're not quite as uh, colorful and fun as uh, you Irish, are we? I'm up, no, I'm delighted that this this state is full of Germans and, and Norwegians because it, it, it elevates the Irish. If I was in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, San Francisco, where there's an Irish uh, on every street corner, I might not stand out. I might not be invited on to... Uh, shows like this on a regular basis. So I'm absolutely delighted with the stoic nature of the Scandinavians and the Germans all day long, all day long. Right. Which is why you do such a great job with your event business is getting in front of a room <laughs> with a bunch of us uh, conservative Scandinavian German types. Uh, I'm not complaining. I, I won't say that it's not uh, been advantageous to have um, a little bit of uh, musical note in the accent, let me tell you. Absolutely. How about uh, moving back? Uh, I, I know it's important because we've talked about this over <laughs> many year period of, of the importance it is to you to have your uh, children involved with Ireland, their family, the heritage. Uh, have you ever considered um, moving back to Ireland? Not full time. I would love to be in a position where I could go and especially, you know, what this last year has taught a lot of us is that we can work from anywhere and our environment. I mean, I'm telling you I'm in Minneapolis right now, but I could I could be anywhere. This wall behind me could be anywhere. Um, but so we have that we have that mindset. I'm fortunate to be in an industry where I can't work from anywhere. And I would like to be in Ireland part of the time. Uh, May to September is always a good time to be in Ireland. Uh, it can get pretty dark and bleak in the winter time. Um, that's when I'd probably want to be in California, and and you know this is these are these are life goals where I can, pardon me, spart, sp spend part of the time in Minnesota, maybe somewhere warm, and then have the homeland there as well. There are certain junctures in the year when I'd really like to be home, and there's sporting occasions on or family occasions that I'd like to be there. So not fully living there full time, but be there for longer periods of time more often. And for uh, the novice travelers out there, if there was a time of year you would recommend folks to go to Ireland, when would it be? Uh, you know, I remember I, when I worked uh, for Kieran and, and those Irish pubs and people would come in and say, hey, we've got once in a lifetime trip to Ireland. Where should we go? And I'm like, I can't I can't be responsible for your family trip. However, Ireland is built and uh, culturally in a way that, you know, you could jump on a plane, land there tomorrow rent a car, drive in any direction, end up in a, a village, spend a night in a bed and breakfast and a couple of days there and you'll come back with more than enough stories to last a lifetime. So there is that. I would say if you're going to go, um, May is a great month, September is a great month. Uh, July and August, unsurprisingly, the weather can be very iffy, but it's also high tourist season. So if you don't want to be surrounded by your own kin, i.e. Americans, um, then maybe May and September are good months to go. 
Um, but really, there's no bad time to go because if you're going for that authentic experience where it's about the people and about the hospitality, you're going to get that at any time in any basically any area. I mean, the area that I grew up in, in Adram Sea, Fermanagh, that northern part of Ireland, we don't have a lot of tourism. But yet you can tell when people go there, they'll come back with stories because it's naturally there for us to to be hospitable for whatever reason. Historically, that's who we've been. That's part of our heritage is part of our narrative. And thankfully, that has maintained itself. I would say if you're going to go organize a trip where maybe you have uh, it curated part of the way. So then, you know, you're kind of like you're you've got your training wheels on and someone is, is giving you the direction. And then you can go back on your own with that sort of uh, knowledge and maybe enjoy it better the second time. But don't ever plan on one trip. All right. That's what I would say. Not The Irish Tourist Board is not paying me for that, but I'm just telling you from experience when people have gone there, don't go just once. All right. That makes sense. Hey, let's jump back to the business uh, world. So you've been involved in a number of different businesses. You've started a couple. Uh, what advice would you give someone who wants to start their own business? Uh, be ready to be discouraged, be ready to, uh, I mean, be, be clear in your own head and maybe write it down why you're starting it. What are, what are your motivating factors? Uh, are they sustainable? Um, do you have enough money to live on for six months? I would say as well, whether that be on credit uh, or even better in savings, uh, because there are no guarantees. And be ready, just like any sort of uh, endeavor that whether it be a relationship, whether it be starting a business, uh, be ready for ups and downs and uh, take the take the rose tinted glasses off. Do plenty of research, uh, ask questions, find out, think about who your customers are, who are you targeting that's going to generate the revenue for your business and go talk to them and ask them about where the pain points are. What do you bring into the table that will differentiate you from your competitors or potential competitors ahead of time? Whether it be a podcast, whether it be a service, whether it be um, almost any industry, uh, what skills do you have that others may not have? What skills do you have that may be better than others? And what are you willing to do that others are not willing to? Are you willing to get up early and stay up late and work on it. And if the answers to all of them are yes, there's still no guarantees. Approach it with a sense of curiosity, of course, I'm gonna say that, but also a sense of adventure. If this is something that need that you need to, uh, if it's a make or break and you need to make it, that's a lot of pressure on there. Understand what those pressures are as you're going into it. Um, and, and how does that align with what you want to achieve? And that'll give you some clarity. And there's no rush. You might think there's a rush and this idea might be the best idea ever and you need to get going with it. Just take, you know what, take your time. The ideas are good. There's a lot of really good ideas out there. What there aren't is a lot of people willing to follow up on it and you have to figure out, are you the one that's willing to put the work in because the, the inspiration you have is very perishable and will disappear and then you're going to get into the grind and is when you get to that grind, is that where you want to spend your time? Is that where you want to see yourself? And if it is, then have at it. And talk a little bit more about uh, trusting your gut. Um, we're talking ahead of the show here today. And uh, you don't always necessarily want to trust your gut, correct? No. You, you know, uh, guts are good, but information's better. I mean, there's a line in the movie Wall Street uh, from the 1980s. The most valuable commodity I know, it's not money. It's not stocks. It's information. Get as much information as you can because information will help make really good decisions. And if anything has taught us in the last year is that the world can be turned upside down in five minutes and be ready for that. Like, it's like, you know, if you, the classic theater, you're, you've got the, the actor, the Shakespearean guy, and he's got the skull here in his hand because what he's trying to communicate is that we don't know. I mean, nobody's immortal. We don't know what's around the corner. So be ready, have it in your head that anything can happen, good or bad, and approach it from that attitude. So I um, had a question come in from Matt, longtime listener. Thanks for uh, participating, Matt. Uh, this sense of curiosity that, that you have, was that something you were born with? Was that something that your parents instilled with you? Where did that uh, curiosity come from? I think I, I think it was a combination of uh, I definitely had a curiosity growing up, and thankfully the 
the nasty teachers in my school didn't completely beat it out of me. And I had parents who didn't, and I meant that literally, um, my, I had parents that I was very fortunate that I had parents who didn't put any of their kids under pressure in terms of achievement. Uh, one of the, you know, the values that they taught us growing up was manners, have manners, have respect. And, you know, manners will take you around the world. People will remember you if you have good manners. That was one of the strong points. You can have all the degrees in the world and all the letters after your name, but if you don't have manners, it's really not worth it. Um, so that allowed us to explore. That allowed us to be curious. My parents weren't asking us at 16 or 17, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because it would change from minute to minute. And so having that frame, with, without having that pressure, I feel like there's so much pressure now to know what you need to do. And I need to have clarity on what I want to do. Let me tell you, from my own experience and hair color aside, there is a lot of value in life in not knowing what it is exactly you want to do. There's a line in the Buzz Lerman song, some of the most interesting people I know at 45 don't know what they want to be when they grow up. Don't put yourself under that pressure. The sense of curiosity comes from a freedom from giving yourself that idea that, well, let me dabble in this and see what happens. And it might be off on the side, you might have a good job and you might it might not be fulfilling you, but over here, give yourself that opportunity to be curious. And then the word, uh, and you used it, was adventure. So when you were talking the, the first time about curiosity, I also wrote down the word adventure. So talk a little bit about what that means to you and how you tie those two together. Yeah, well, having a sense of curiosity will lead to adventures. That there is no doubt uh, in my mind, because you, if you allow yourself that idea of I'm going to follow this, I don't know where it's going to take me. You're already adopting an adventurous spirit and an adventurous mindset that's going to carry you through when, you know, you're at the bottom of the creek and you're looking up and you don't know how you're going to get out of it. Um, it's that sense of, well, this is all part of the adventure. Um, that, that's going to keep your curiosity going. It's important to keep that sense of curiosity lit and, and um, keep it going and keep it strong because that's what will fill, uh, fulfill the life of, uh, of adventure, whether it be personally or professionally. So um, again, uh, your career done a bunch of interesting things, uh, lots of lessons along the way, lived in multiple locations, uh, came from a uh, small town, rural location, now in a you know, medium-sized metro. So lots of life's lessons, especially following the curiosity and adventure uh, that you do. Uh, was there a lesson that you learned somewhere along there that you wish you would have learned sooner? Yes. Um, not to take it all so serious. <laughs> not to put so much pressure on, because whether you put pressure on or you don't, is really not going to change the outcome and, and know what you can control and what you can't control. For years, I, I've been a, a fan of the soccer team Arsenal. When I was a kid, they had seven Irishmen on their team, basically the Irish national team playing in the top league in England. And my week would determine on how they did on the weekend. And then I realized, wait a minute, I have no control over how this team does. Nothing, no amount of screaming at the TV, or even if I go to the stadium, is changing the outcome of the game. So why am I letting that determine my mood for the rest of the week? It just seemed like this light went on, and I wish I had learned that earlier, because it's important to know what you can control. And if you're feeling stuck, look at what you can do. Okay, well, I've got, like I've, I read somewhere, writer's block was invented in the 1950s. You don't have thought block. You don't have talking block. I know I don't. Uh, you know, you have thoughts, write them down. Suddenly your writer's block is gone. So really question yourself when you're when you say to yourself, I'm feeling stuck. I'm feeling in a funk. What is that narrative? What is the point of that? And how do you take yourself out of it? Well, look at what you can do. And I wish I'd learned that a lot earlier. So um, not a question I'm guessing you were thinking you're going to get today, but as a father of four and three, kids, just three, no, 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 no. unless I'm, there's something, unless it's like Jerry Springer, are you going to throw something at me, Rick? No, 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 no. I'm a father of four. They're in their twenties. So they're older than yours. 
and I reflect back on the different things that I've done and feeling good about how my, my children, now young adults, have, have turned out very proud of them. Obviously, you're very proud of, of your children. You mentioned a couple of things about uh, what your parents did or did not do. Um, as you kind of reflect on your, on your business learnings and your parents, um, how have you uh, transferred some of those things to your parenting style? Well, I definitely try not to put my kids under any pressure in terms of academia or achievement. It re there's a lot of focus on engagement. I, like many people, I have no time for participation medals. Um, the, the joy of participation needs to be a thing in of itself. You don't need to be rewarded just for participating. Um, I think it's, it's interesting from a cultural standpoint, there's cultural elements within the United States that I struggle with, <clears throat> that there's sort of the drive for individualism is, a, is something I struggle with here, despite the fact that I'm self-employed, because I'm very, very aware of the community and the support that I've received and, the, and, and the, the blessings that I've had bestowed upon me and the luck. There isn't enough emphasis on luck here in the US. People need to realize there's a lot of luck and I am, I am the poster child for luck. The poster child. I grew up in the north of Ireland, which, you know, I let your people uh, do their own studying on it, where opportunities were limited because of the political situation there. And suddenly I come to the United States and I'm a free thinking entrepreneur. Maybe I always was, but I wasn't given that opportunity. And so the opportunities here, given my background in the US, is very important. So I, I tell that to my kids. I tell them and I try to, without preaching to them, really let them know the opportunities and the blessings that they've been uh, presented with as people here in the in the Twin Cities. Uh, and to, to really, once you practice, when, when you have it in your head that you have those um, blessings, then it makes life a little bit more clear in my mind. So from a parenting standpoint, I try not to put them under any pressure. I, of course, encourage them and to follow their curiosity themselves. There's a certain level of competency that they need to achieve in order to uh, do well here in this culture and so around academia that they need to attain and whatever they need to help them with that, that's that's there. But back to Kieran's comment about hot food and cold beer, what's the differentiator? It's gonna be who you are, what's your service, where are your manners? and how you treat and respect others and people around you and your community that will really set you apart from the others. And that's, you know, my 10 year old daughter said once, I think my dad likes manners more than he likes us because those are, those are elements that are going to separate you from the crowd. I love it. I love it. Hey, um, I have a question from Darren Lynch, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but um, want to, uh, you, you touched on the luck aspect. So, is there uh, a story to the origins at the pot of the end of the rainbow? And if so, do you have any uh, either uh, understanding or realization of what that is? Or can you weave a story for us right now and make it up on the fly that makes, uh, makes for a good uh, interview? Well, you know, the, 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 well, let's see. Uh, no pressure, Rick. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the whole, I mean, you can't get a rainbow without rain. And I don't like rain, but I like rainbows. So there, there is something to be said there. If you if you stand in the rain long enough, you'll get the rainbow. And to me, the the pot of gold is is a nice metaphor for something that can't be attained, but something to shoot for. So yes, by all means, keep shooting for the pot of gold, or as my mom used to say, shoot for the moon, and you might hit the stars. And and and, and to me, it's a variation on that. The pot of gold, of course, can mean anything. Uh, to me, it means finding contentment, it's finding that fulfillment so that when you get up in the morning, if it happens to be your last day, you're not going to have any regrets and you're doing something you love and that you enjoy. Do you have to have all the boxes ticked and lead the perfect life to enjoy that? No. Instead of, you know, I know in the US, um, they've got the pursuit of happiness. I would change it slightly and say the pot of gold is the pursuit of contentment, because if you're content, you can still have your ambition but it's not, it's not attaining something external to you that's going to give you that pot of gold. It's all from within. Okay, there you so go, Dick. That's the best I got. All right. Well, I like it very much. So there's not, there's not an Irish fable about a leprechaun or that, that 
uh, rainbows across Northern Ireland, or there's, there's definitely no rainbows across Northern Ireland, not at the present time with Brexit and all that nonsense. Uh, they're probably looking for a rainbow because it's raining there pretty hard at the moment, but that's a whole different podcast. All right. Well, we'll, we'll do that next time. We'll Very good. have you back to talk uh, soccer and politics. All right. <laughs> so question from Darren Lynch and just a reminder to our audience, uh, Darren Lynch and Iris Titan have been a sponsor of club E for so many years. I can't even remember how many. So, we are grateful uh, for that relationship, grateful for them. And if you need a fabulous e-commerce website, the website is- No Irish better man, I'll give him my full endorsement. Yes, exactly. And uh, John and I are both good friends with Darren. In fact, we saw each other last at one of Darren's um, birthday parties. So anyway, yes. uh, so I might pronounce this wrong because I'm not uh, in the middle of the Irish pub scene. I have to- um, unfortunately admit to, but Darren's question is, do you pronounce this pub Corny? C-O-R-R-A-N-N-Y? Corani. Corani. That's my it, local pub at home, Okay, which Darren the, has been to. Is the Corani pub as good as advertised? I think it is, but of course, I am extremely biased, and I make no apologies for my bias, but everyone that I've recommended to go there has had a story and uh, Darren's story was he was sitting at the bar and uh, he was being left alone until he bought everybody a drink and then everybody wanted to be his friend and they were able to tell him all sorts of lies about my childhood and about my adventures growing up. So um, I am completely biased as I'm sure Darren is. Yes, it is as good as advertised. All right, well, um, and Darren, not a small man, um, so we were uh, thanking Darren for um, something nice that he does uh, or did for our family, as he often does. And we gave him a shirt. And I don't know if this is shamrockery or not, but the shirt said the world's largest leprechaun. <laughs> sham, sham, shamrockery or good humor? Uh, you know what? It's straddling that line and it's very thin. But, you know, I think we're good. I think we're just good. Just about in there. Well, well, if uh, for those of you who have not seen Darren, probably six four, <laughs> probably two thirty. Like, he looks like a lead, a lead actor, lead extra out of Braveheart, with the long red curly hair and the big beard. So, if he was a leprechaun, he probably would be the world's largest leprechaun. He probably would. If 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 the band Kiss were Irish, they'd probably probably be the lead singer. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so uh, ending on that, uh, as you look back over our conversation today, um, is there one key takeaway that you'd like the audience to bring with them? And um, what would it be and why? Uh, it would be, first of all, be aware of the many, many gifts and attributes that are at your disposal right away. So acknowledge those. Uh, use that as a springboard to move forward because we have we have so many tools and and um, elements in front of us, and um, I think from there you can't go wrong with that sort of like being grateful and being aware of what you have first as a way of moving forward, and let the future take care of itself because it's never going to be exactly as you envision because it's always a guesstimate. It never is. I did an exercise last week where I wrote a letter to my future self just as a way of thinking ahead, and I can't wait in a year's time to look back and read. I like those quirky little things. But again, don't put yourself under too much pressure. There's a lot of things going on in the world. A lot of things can change, as we know. And, um, you know, all you can control is right now. It seems corny and it seems cheesy, but that's all we got is right now and make the most of it. And then, John, if uh, somebody wanted to reach out to you, how would they connect up? Uh, I got an a email, john at voicehive.com. Um, voicehive.com has a lot more of my contact info and I'm also on LinkedIn. Start there, send me a note, drop me a line. We'll get in touch. We'll have a chat and go from there. Tip a, tip a pint back. Without question, Rick, without question. All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, look forward to having you back again and happy St. Patrick's Day. Hey, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. Very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Goramila Mahagat. Ni higam ashgilga agus apawig ditch or something like that. Okay, one more time. Say that one more time. I'm gonna memorize that. Give me a second, Ron. <laughs> all you got is all you got to memorize is ni higam ashgilga, which means I don't understand Gaelic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. <laughs>